You're watching My IPS on My Indie TV 23, a free educational service provided by Circle City Broadcasting of Indianapolis. Here's what's coming up this hour. Get more information, special announcements, and weekly program schedules online at wishtv.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook. Here's what's coming up next. to Knowledge on the Go, Wit and Wisdom's virtual learning experience. As you know, my name is Stacy Fitzwater, and I am one of your teachers for our fourth grade Module 4 learning. Today I'm excited to continue our learning with the start of Lesson 3. Make sure you are ready to think, to share your ideas, to get excited about our new information, and as always, try to stay focused. Today, in order to be successful, you will need a copy of each of our texts, Gifts from the Gods, and Understanding Greek Myths. Now remember, if you don't have those with you, not a problem. You'll be able to share and read along with me. We will also be using handout 3A, which is called Pandora's Box Organizer. And as always, you will need your journal and a pencil with which to write. We'll begin our work today by watching an excerpt from the video called Secrets of the Parthenon. As we watch, I want you to think to yourself, how would ancient Greeks have felt looking at the Parthenon for the very first time? Peering over the rooftops of modern Athens, from its throne atop the ancient Acropolis, the sacred city in the sky, the Parthenon rules in shimmering splendor. Even in its present form, a stark marble ruin, the Parthenon is revered as an icon of Western civilization. Its shapely muscular columns, crowned with majestic capitals, are the very symbol of the classical world. Its height and width define perfect proportions. Its original sculptures have been looted and lusted after for their beauty. And if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, the Parthenon reigns as the most copied building in the world, from the French Parliament to the U.S. Supreme Court to banks, museums, and countless buildings that aspire to convey wealth, culture, and power. Wow. Imagine looking at that architecture for the very first time. Why do you think later cultures would be influenced by this architecture? Why do you think they would want to use it? There were some hints at the end of our video. There are a lot of great ideas being shared. I heard someone share that the columns look strong and solid, so maybe this demonstrates the strength of a nation or group of people. Someone else shared that the building looks tough and difficult to penetrate. Maybe that's why people would model banks after this architecture. I also heard that the shape is very easy to look at and beautiful, so maybe architects wanted to show that. The last thing I heard was that the Parthenon seems to show an honor for Greek culture, and this is the origin of democracy. Great thinking. Now, can you predict, based on what we've discussed so far, the focus of this lesson? We'll be focusing on what the ancient Greeks believed, 
we can understand why people created myths if we know what they believed in. So think now, how does the Parthenon represent the beliefs of the ancient Greeks? You may remember that the Parthenon was a place to honor the goddess Athena, and this goddess was very important to the city of Athens. Sculptures of the gods and goddesses were all over the Parthenon, which means it was very important to the Greeks. We also know that the ancient Greeks believed in and worshipped many gods and goddesses. So as we continue to explore what we can learn from myths and stories in this module, we'll focus on reading myths and information about them so we can develop a deeper understanding of their purpose. Remember, in these first several lessons, we're trying to answer our focusing question. What are myths and why do people create them? Today's lesson focuses on the content stage reveal. We can understand why the ancient Greeks created myths by knowing their beliefs. So, we'll begin the lesson by reading Pandora's Box. This is so that we can understand how a Greek myth reveals the beliefs of the ancient Greeks. Let's start with page 59 in Gifts from the Gods. Read aloud the definition with me of Pandora's Box. A noun a source of many unforeseen troubles or problems. And here's a quote from the book, The Face on the Milk Carton, written by Caroline B. Cooney. It's Pandora's box, isn't it? The myth. The minute you opened that milk carton, it was all there, every evil thing, and you'll never be able to put it back. It's out now. What questions does the definition of Pandora's box raise for you? Remember, Good detectives start with questions that they want to investigate. Let's turn to the next clean page in your journal. If you have it, take out handout 3A. If you don't, just like me, we can make the chart in our journals to use instead, like this. Turn to the next clean page in the front of your journal and create a chart with two columns like mine. We will be answering five questions using details from the sections of each text. So I've numbered one through five down the left margin. We will use the handout or the chart you just created in your journal to capture these important details after we read each text. Pandora was the first woman on earth. Zeus commanded Hephaestus, the god of fire and sculpture, to create her. Hephaestus modeled her body of earth, gave her a face like the immortal goddesses, and infused her with a human voice and vigor. What does it mean to infuse? That's right, to mix together. Let's keep reading. When he was done, each god bestowed a special gift on her. Aphrodite gave her matchless beauty. Athena clothed her in silken gowns and taught her the art of needlework. Apollo gave her the gift of music, Hermes the power of persuasion. The three graces covered her in jewels and braided her hair with sweetly scented flowers. When the gods and goddesses were finished, Zeus gave her one final gift, insatiable curiosity. What does it mean that each god bestowed a special gift? Yes, bestowed means to be given something. They were giving her gifts. And Zeus gave her one final gift, insatiable curiosity. If something is insatiable, it means it can't be satisfied. Let's keep reading. Because they had granted her one gift each, the gods named this new creature Pandora, which means all gifts. But Zeus had not made Pandora out of kindness. Rather, he was planning to use her as a way to punish humans and their protector, the god Prometheus. Prometheus had stolen fire from the gods in defiance of Zeus's orders and given it to mankind, knowing that Prometheus would be suspicious of a gift from him. Zeus offered Pandora in marriage to Epimetheus, who was Prometheus's brother. As a wedding gift, he sent along a lovely carved box. Handing the box to Pandora, Zeus looked her in the eye and warned, Don't ever open it. In those days, the world was a wonderful place to live. 
There was no sadness, no sickness, no old age, and no quarrels, and Pandora was very happy. Only one thing came to bother her, the mysterious box and its forbidden content. What do you think it means when the text says there were no quarrels? What is a quarrel? Yes, to quarrel is to fight or argue. So in those days in the world, there were no fights and no arguing. Let's keep reading. She could not get the box out of her mind. Why give a wedding gift and tell me I cannot open it? Surely Zeus had not meant what he said, thought Pandora. One day, while Epimetheus was away, Pandora could no longer resist the urge to sneak a look inside the box. Carefully, she cracked the lid open. Something within was crawling around. Tiny voices pleaded with her to let them out. Overcome with curiosity, Pandora flung open the lid. Let us out, let us out. Whoosh! Out from the box flew howling, wailing, snarling, insect-like creatures. Every misery burst forth. Disease, anger, cruelty, old age, despair, pain, suffering, lies, envy, gossip, vanity, greed, anxiety, and revenge filled the room and flew out the window to scatter all over the world. Horrified, Pandora slammed the lid shut. She tried to catch some of the miseries and put them back into the box, but it was too late. The only thing left in the box was a small, trembling thing. Hope. From then on, human life has been filled with great difficulty. But because Pandora caught hope before it could escape, humans are able to endure all the hardships that afflict us. With hope, all things are possible. I noticed the word endure in the text. Endure means to work through or deal with a difficult challenge or event. And so with hope, humans can work through challenges. Let's keep reading. The Romans called Hephaestus, the god that made Pandora out of clay, Vulcan, the god of fire. He lived inside Mount Etna, where he constantly labored at his forge, fashioning tools, jewelry, and even robots. Sometimes he worked so hard that his forge overheated, causing Mount Etna to burst forth with black smoke and fire, sending melted rocks down the mountainside. Because it was Vulcan who brought about these eruptions, people began to call Mount Etna and every mountain that behaved similarly a volcano. I'm curious about any notes you took while we read the myth Pandora's Box. I've zoomed in on the top of our chart. Remember, you can either use the handout or the chart we created in our journals. Let's think about this first question. So those who are using a notebook, you'll want to write your responses in the top of your chart, where I numbered the number one in the left margin. Think about Pandora's box. What role did the Greek gods play in this story? Let's go back to the text. I remember reading that Zeus commanded Hephaestus to create Pandora. She was the first human woman. And Hephaestus infused her with human voice and vigor. Remember, we said infused means to mix together. So Hephaestus mixed together these things to create the first human woman. Each god also bestowed on her a special gift. And we said bestowed means to give something. Zeus gave her curiosity that was insatiable. She could not be satisfied. And Zeus wanted to punish Prometheus for stealing fire from the gods and giving it to the humans. So he tricked him by giving his brother Pandora. So let's make sure we've captured a few of these really important details from Pandora's box. When we think about what role the gods played, we know that they created Pandora, the first human woman, and gave her gifts. We also know that Zeus played the role of punishing Prometheus for stealing fire and tricking him by giving his brother Pandora in marriage. Let's move on. Now here's a new question. What was the problem in the myth Pandora's box? Let's go back to the text. We read, the world was initially a wonderful place. It had no bad things, including no quarrels, which we said means to fight or argue. 
Pandora was curious and she couldn't control her desire to open that box. She opened the box that Zeus gave her and even though she wasn't supposed to, which we think was intentional on Zeus's part, bad things flew out, including things like pain and greed. This was certainly the problem in the myth. So let's look at your handout or the chart you created in your journal. I see that we collected the details about Pandora's curiosity. We also noticed that part of the problem was that she opened the box when she wasn't supposed to, causing greed and pain and other bad things to fly out. Let's move on. Number three, how was this problem resolved? As always, we need to find our evidence in the text. The myth Pandora's box ended with hope. This was the only thing remaining in the box. And so humans can still have hope, even though there are bad things in the world. The text said that with hope, humans are able to endure. Endure means we can work through or deal with a challenging event. And so the text told us that hope helps humans deal with difficult situations. So let's go back to the chart and the question. How was the problem resolved? We know that hope remained in the box that Pandora opened, and that hope is what helps humans deal with difficult situations. Next, we have question number four. So we've read about how myths were used to teach lessons. What idea do you think Pandora's box explains? I had several ideas about what the myth explains. It told us why there are evils in the world like sickness and despair. The myth also explained that humans caused the release of these evil things in the world. And finally, the myth told us that there is hope to help humans get through difficult times. Let's reflect on what we've read. What can we learn about the beliefs of the ancient Greeks from the myth Pandora's box? I love hearing your ideas. Let's take a look at what details we should include in our chart. Some ideas I've heard are that the gods created humans, and so the ancient Greeks worshipped them. That's definitely important detail that we learn about the beliefs of ancient Greeks in these myths. I also heard someone share that people will be punished for their bad behavior or for disobeying the gods. And finally, it's important to know that the myth showed that the Greeks believed that the gods wanted people to behave a certain way. Think about how this relates to the word moral what the good or right thing is to do. We can learn more about the beliefs of the ancient Greeks by reading a section of our other text, Understanding Greek Myths. As we read, we need to add supporting details to the right column of our charts in order to support the details from Pandora's box. Then, after we read, we'll go over the chart and share what we've written. If you don't have the text, don't worry you'll be able to follow along with this video. We'll start with page 10 of Understanding Greek Myths, Religion and Gods. Many religions today believe in just one God. The ancient Greeks followed polytheism. They believed in many gods and goddesses. Each one had a special role in the world. Greek myths explained the origins of the gods and how they affected everyday life. Not all the gods had the same importance. The Greeks believed that Zeus was the king of the gods and had some control over all the others. Other gods managed certain parts of nature. Poseidon ruled over the sea, Hades ruled the underworld, where the dead were sent, and Helios ruled the sun. Other gods and goddesses were in charge of the seasons, hunting, or music. But the gods were not seen as all-powerful. Even Zeus had to obey the fates who controlled what would happen in the future. The Greek gods looked like humans and acted like them too. They had faults and weaknesses, such as jealousy and pride, and if they did wrong, they were punished. Greek ceremonies and rituals were performed at altars and temples. To keep the gods happy, ancient Greeks made offerings and sacrifices. Animal sacrifices were a way of worshiping the gods. Parts of the animal were burned for the gods, while the rest of the meat was eaten by the followers in a big feast as part of the ceremony. Offerings were also made to different gods as a way to say thanks for blessings or to ask them for help in hard times. Food, drink, or precious items were left for the god or goddess at the altar in their temple. Take a look at the green box 
entitled oracles. In ancient Greece, an oracle was a person who gave good advice and could predict the future. People believed that the gods spoke directly to them through the oracle. The oracle at Apollo's beautiful temple in Delphi was a woman. Caption right. This building at Delphi was used as a storehouse for donations to the oracle. It was built in about 500 BCE. On page 11, the caption for the photo below it. The Greek gods and goddesses Leto, Apollo, Artemis, and Zeus, left to right, are shown together on this carving. Finally, look at the green heading, Apollo and the Oracle at Delphi. Apollo was the son of Zeus and Leto. He had many strengths, including healing, music, poetry, and archery. One of his greatest gifts was the gift of prophecy, the ability to tell the future. In the Greek town of Delphi lived the python, a large snake who guarded a hole in the ground. Apollo killed the snake. The people were so grateful, they built a temple there to honor him. He decided that this was the perfect spot to share his gift of prophecy. Instead of acting as the oracle himself, he shared his gift with a priestess named Pythia. He put limits on her power, though, so she would never be as powerful as him. She could not answer yes or no, but only make truthful statements. Apollo's oracle became famous across ancient Greece for her wisdom and knowledge. Page 12. Gods of Creation for ancient Greeks, the world was created by the gods. This included not only the landscape, but even the parts they could not see with their own eyes, such as the heavens and the underworld. Through their creation myths, the ancient Greeks were able to see the world as a place with an order to it. See the myth on the next page, 13. Earth, love, the underworld, darkness, and night came first. In the Greek myths, these gods and goddesses, who were born at the beginning of the universe, had children, who created the rest of the world. Eros was the god of love, and Nyx was the goddess of night. Some of her children included Aether, the air, Oneiroi, dreams, and Hypnos, sleep. There were different classes of gods. The 12 most powerful gods, including Zeus, Hestia, and Hera, were called Olympians because they lived on Mount Olympus. They each had their own character and domain. They had strengths and weaknesses, and represented every part of human nature. Their relatives were the titans, giants, and other creatures who were sent to live underground. Link to today. Gaia was the earth mother, and Zeus was god of the heavens. We still use the phrases mother earth and heavenly father today. Page 13. Minor gods. The ancient Greeks also prayed to other, less powerful gods, who roamed earth and played a part in the everyday lives of the people. Craft workers might pray to Techni, the spirit of art and skill. There were also nymphs, who were the spirits of the earth, sea, and sky. Dryads, who were the nymphs of the trees, were tied to their tree homes and died if the tree died. There were also many different types of mythical beasts created by the gods. The gorgons, centaurs, sirens, and harpies were just some of the creatures who helped or interfered with the gods, creating problems and tension in the world. Caption for the picture above. The mythical Gorgon was a terrifying woman, often with snakes in place of her hair. Caption for the image on the left. A battle scene on a Greek vase from 570 BCE shows a centaur fighting a soldier. A centaur was a mythical beast that was half man, half horse. Chaos, Gaia, and Oranos. The ancient Greeks believed that the gods created the heavens and earth and all things in them. In the beginning, there was a vast, empty space called chaos. Out of chaos came Gaia, which is earth, and Eros. Gaia gave birth to Oranos, the heavens, and she had many children with him. These included twelve titans, who were powerful gods, three one-eyed giants, called the Cyclopses, and the three Hecatonchires, who each had 100 arms and 50 heads. Oranos did not like any of his children, so he hid them deep inside earth. This made Gaia angry. She convinced the titan named Cronus to wound his father. Cronus did this, and from Oranos's blood sprang other giants, nymphs, fierce goddesses called the Furies, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Page 14, Prometheus. Prometheus was a titan one of a race of powerful gods. He was the champion of humankind, and he used his cleverness to help them. One day, 
Prometheus took clay and made figures of humans. The goddess Athena breathed life into the clay figures. Zeus was angry with Prometheus for creating people and refused to let him give them fire. Zeus was worried that with fire, the humans would become powerful like the gods. But Prometheus felt sorry for the cold and hungry humans and wanted to help them. He found a reed plant with a stem filled with dry material that would burn easily. Without Zeus knowing, took it with him to Mount Olympus. He went to the place where the morning sun rose and let the fires of the sun light the material inside the stem. He raced back down to earth and gave fire to the humans. Zeus was so angry that he chained Prometheus to a post and punished him. Each day, a huge eagle ate his liver. Each night, his liver grew back, so he would be punished over and over. Below in the image, the caption reads, In one version of the myth, Prometheus modeled humans out of clay, and the goddess Athena breathed on the figures to bring them to life. Page 15. Humans and Morality The gods and goddesses in Greek myths were immortal, which meant they lived forever. They ruled their domains for all time. Unlike the gods, humans were mortal. The Greeks believed that after the, their death, they would pass on to the underworld. When the gods created animals, they used the help of two titans. The titan Epimetheus gave the animals gifts, and Prometheus inspected his work. Epimetheus gave some animals swiftness and others strength or beauty. When humans came along, Epimetheus had nothing left to give them, so Prometheus gave humans, civilization, and culture instead. The Underworld The ancient Greeks believed that once their life was over, their spirits would travel to the underworld. It was called Hades, after the god who ruled it. This place of the dead was dark and gloomy. Souls had to cross the river Acheron to reach the underworld. Charon was the ferryman who transported the souls of the dead from one side of the river to the other. Ancient Greeks placed a coin in the mouth of the dead person as payment to Charon. Prevent a haunting. The ancient Greeks believed that providing a proper funeral was the way to prevent the spirit of the dead person from coming back to haunt them. The relatives would wash and clothe the body and then lay it out for people to pay their respects. Then they would walk in a funeral procession to the burial place, where the body or ashes were then buried. The grave would be marked either with a burial mound or a tomb so that the deceased would not be forgotten. The family would make regular visits to the grave to leave offerings of food and drink. Caption for the image below. The Greek hero Eschelos carries away the heroine Lassil to the underworld in his chariot, while the god Hermes leads the way. Let's respond to the same questions as before, but add our supporting details to this right-hand side of your chart, either on your handout or on the chart you created in your journal. Let's start with the first question. What role did the gods play? In Pandora's box, gods controlled life on Earth. So what evidence could we find in our text Understanding Greek Myths that supports the main point that the gods controlled life on Earth? We read that Zeus was king of the gods and had control over other gods. We also read that Poseidon ruled the sea and Hades ruled the underworld, where people went when they were dead. Other gods controlled different things like music or hunting, but they didn't have as much power as major gods like Zeus. We also read that gods looked like humans and had emotions like humans. For example, jealousy. Pandora's box told us that Pandora was a gift, but she was really a punishment. This shows us that the gods were in control of sharing their gifts with people. Gods were also in control because humans made offerings to them to ask them for help. Let's make sure we've captured a few of these important details. Remember, your notes don't have to be exactly like mine. Great. So your notes should capture the supporting evidence that the Greeks believed in many gods and Zeus was king. We also need evidence that gods managed parts of nature, had faults and weaknesses just like humans, and that people performed rituals in order to keep them happy. For our second question, we need to know what evidence supports the problem. Well, we read additional information to support the problem from the myth in Pandora's box. On page 14 of Understanding Greek Myths, we read that Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. 
Zeus wanted to punish Prometheus for disobeying him. From reading this additional information, we know that Pandora was a gift, but she was really a punishment. So you should have evidence now showing that Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans. Zeus wanted to punish him for these actions, and so while Pandora was considered a gift, she was really a punishment. This is My IPS on My Indie TV 23. Here's what's coming up next. Knowledge on the Go, Wit and Wisdom, Virtual Lessons. My name is Mary Lou Lopez, and I'll be one of your teachers for this virtual experience. Before we get started, let's make sure you have all the materials you'll need to learn. For this lesson, you will need a pencil or something to write with, your journal, and handout to be Raymond's Run. If you don't have access to the handouts, that's okay. I will read the story aloud during our lesson, and you can replay it as necessary. Remember our essential question. The big question we are exploring in this module is, how can sports influence individuals and societies? In this first set of lessons, we are thinking deeply about our, how our sports can affect the way we view others in lesson one. We saw how South Africa's victory at 1995 Rugby World Cup helped United citizens and made them focus on their similarities rather than their differences. As we read Raymond's Run today, let's consider how it builds our knowledge of how sports can affect the way we view other people. To begin, think back to what you learned about Squeaky in the first part of Raymond's Run. Put yourself in her shoes for a moment and think. How would she describe herself? If it's helpful, you can use the sentence frame on the slide to complete the prompt, filling in the highlighted blanks with your ideas. Be sure to write in a complete sentence in Squeaky's first person point of view. So, what words do you think Squeaky would use to describe herself? Are they different than the words you would use to describe her? How did this activity help you better understand? Squeaky's perspective or viewpoint. Take a moment to read this definition of perspective. Listen as I read the definition out loud. One's point of view or way of looking at something or someone. In part one and two of this lesson, as we read Raymond's run, we will take a closer look at Squeaky's perspective or viewpoint. A person's perspective includes their view of their self, themselves, others, and the world. We will focus on how Squeaky views other characters in Raymond's run, particularly her older brother, Raymond, and her new rival, Gretchen, and how her views change by the end of the story. To understand how Squeaky's perspective changes in the story, we must first make sure we understand and capture her views at the beginning of the story. In a moment, we are going to reread the first part of Raymond's run. This time, we're going to read with a specific purpose to understand how Squeaky views her older brother, Raymond, and her new running rival, Gretchen. Let's take a moment to set up a graphic organizer to help you gather evidence as we read. You will use this evidence in Lesson 4 when you complete your first module assessment, focusing question task 1. Open up to a blank spread in your journal. At the top of the right page, write Squeaky's view of Raymond at the beginning. Underneath, make a T-chart with two columns. Label the left column evidence. Remember, evidence includes actual words from the text that support an idea. This is where you will record actual words from the text that show Squeaky's view of each character. Label the right column elaboration. Elaborate means to explain your ideas more fully. In this column, 
you will explain what each piece of evidence shows about Squeaky's view of Raymond or Gretchen. At the top of the left page, write Squeaky's view of Gretchen at the beginning. Underneath, make a T-chart with two columns labeled evidence and elaboration, just as you did on the first chart. Now, we will reread the first part of Raymond's run. As you read or listen to me read aloud, jot down details in the evidence columns that show Squeaky's initial views of Raymond and Gretchen. In the elaboration column, explain what does this evidence show about how Squeaky views each character. Let's get reading. I don't have much to do around the house like some girls. My mother does that. And I don't have to earn my pocket money by hustling. George runs errands for the big boys and sells Christmas cards. And anything else that's got to be get done, my father does. All I have to do in life is mind my brother Raymond, which is enough. Sometimes I slip and say my little brother Raymond, but as any fool can see, he's much bigger, and he's older too. But a lot of people call him my little brother because he needs looking after, because he's not quite right. And a lot of smart mouths got lots to say about that too, especially when George was minding him. But now, if anybody has anything to say to Raymond, anything to say about his big head, they have to come by me. And I don't play the dozens or believe in standing around with somebody in my face doing a lot of talking. i much rather just knock you down and take my chances, even if I am a little girl with skinny arms and a squeaky voice, which is how I got the name Squeaky. And if things get too rough, I run. And as anybody can tell you, I'm the fastest thing on two feet. Now let's think. In these opening paragraphs, did you notice these lines? All I have to do in life is mind my brother Raymond, which is enough. And a lot of people call him my little brother because he needs looking after. Hmm, these lines seem to be evidence of Squeaky's view of Raymond. What does this evidence show us about how Squeaky views her brother. I think they show us that Squeaky views Raymond as her responsibility. She looks after him just as her other family members have other chores and responsibilities. Squeaky sees Raymond as rather childlike, someone in need of looking after. These are just some ideas. I'm sure you have other ideas. Add any of these ideas to your chart. Here's an example of what your chart would look like. Squeaky's view of Raymond at the beginning. Here's our evidence and our elaboration. Let's continue reading. While I read the next two chapters, start looking at the evidence of Squeaky's view of Raymond or Gretchen. There is no track meet that I don't win the first place medal. I used to win the 20-yard dash when I was a little kid in kindergarten. Nowadays, it's the 50-yard dash, and tomorrow, I'm subject to win the quarter-meter relay all by myself and come in first, second, and third. The big kids call me Mercury, because I'm the swiftest thing in the neighborhood. Everybody knows that, except two people who know better, my father and me. He can beat me to Amsterdam Avenue with me having a two-fire hydrant head start and him running with his hands in his pockets and whistling. But that's private information. Because can you imagine some 35-year-old man stuffing himself into pal shorts to race little kids? So as far as everyone's concerned, I'm the fastest, and that goes for Gretchen too, who has put out the tale that she is going to win the first place medal this year. Ridiculous. In the second place, She's got short legs. In the third place, she's got freckles. In the first place, no one can beat me. And that's all there is to it. I'm standing on the corner, admiring the weather, and about to take a stroll down Broadway so I can practice my breathing exercise. And I've got Raymond walking on the inside, close to the buildings, because he's subject to fit 
acts of fantasy and starts thinking he's a circus performer and that the curb is a tight rope strung high in the air. And sometimes, after a rain, he likes to step off his tight rope right into the gutter and slosh around getting his shoes and cuffs wet. Then I get hit when I get home. Or sometimes, if you don't watch him, he'll dash across the traffic to the island in the middle of Broadway and give the pigeons a fit. Then I have to go behind him, apologizing to all the old people sitting around trying to get some sun and getting all upset with the pigeons fluttering around them, scattering their newspapers and upsetting the wax paper lunches in their laps. So I keep Raymond on the inside of me, and he plays like he's driving a stagecoach, which is okay by me, so long as he doesn't run me over or interrupt my breathing exercises, which I have to do on account of I'm serious about my running and I don't care who knows it. Now let's go back and find some evidence of how Squeaky views Gretchen at the beginning of the story. Let's look at paragraph three. In paragraph three, this line stood out to me. So far as everyone's concerned, I'm the fastest. And that goes for Gretchen too, who has put out the tale that she's going to win the first place medal this year. Ridiculous. How is this evidence a Squeaky's view of Gretchen? What do you think? I think this evidence shows that Squeaky views Gretchen purely as her rival. She has challenged Squeaky, and Squeaky is determined to beat her. What else might this show us about how Squeaky views Gretchen? What other evidence did you find in these paragraphs of how Squeaky views Raymond? Continue with the rest of our story. And while I'm reading out loud, what other evidence can you notice in this part of the story that reveals Squeaky's perspective? on either Raymond or Gretchen. Now, some people like to act like things come easy to them, won't let on that they practice. Not me. I'll high prance down 34th Street like a rodeo pony to keep my knees strong, even if it does get my mother uptight so that she walks ahead like she's not with me. Don't know me. Is all by herself on a shopping trip and I am somebody else's crazy child. Now you take Cynthia Proctor, for instance. She's just the opposite. If there's a test tomorrow, she'll say something like, oh, I guess I'll play handball this afternoon and watch television tonight, just to let you know she ain't thinking about the test. Or like last week, when she won the spelling bee for the millionth time. A good thing you got received, Squeaky. Because I would have got it wrong. I completely forgot about the spelling bee. And she'll clutch the lace on her blouse like it was a narrow escape. Oh, brother. But of course, when I pass her house on my early morning trots around the block, she is practicing the scales on the piano over and over and over and over. Then in music class, she always lets herself get bumped around so she falls accidentally on purpose onto the piano stool and is so surprised to find herself sitting there that she decides just for fun to try out the old keys. And what do you know? Chop and waltz just spring out of her fingertips and she's the most surprised thing in the world, a regular prodigy. I could kill people like that. I stay up all night studying the words for the spelling bee. And you can see me any time of day practicing running. I never walk if I can trot. And shame on Raymond if he can't keep up. But of course he does. Because if he hangs back, someone's liable to walk up to him and get smart. Or take his allowance from him. Or ask him where he got that great big pumpkin head. People are so stupid sometimes. So I'm strolling down Broadway. Breathing out and breathing in on counts of seven, which is my lucky number. And here comes Gretchen and her sidekicks. Mary Louise, who used to be a friend of mine when she first moved to Harlem from Baltimore and got beat up by everybody till I took up for her on account of her mother and my mother used to sing in the same choir when they were young girls. But people ain't grateful. So now she hangs out with a new girl, Gretchen and talks 
about me like a dog, and Rosie, who is as fat as I am skinny and has a big mouth, where Raymond is concerned and is too stupid to know that there is not a big deal of difference between herself and Raymond and that she can't afford to throw stones. So they are steady coming up Broadway, and I see right away that it's going to be one of those Dodge City scenes because the street ain't that big and they're close to the buildings, just as we are. First, I think I'll step into the candy store and look over the new comics and let them pass. But that's chicken, and I've got a reputation to consider. So then I think I'll just walk straight on through them, or even over them if necessary. But as they get to me, they slow down. I'm ready to fight, because like I said, I don't feature a whole lot of chit-chat. I much prefer to just knock you down right from the jump and save everybody a lot of precious time. You signing up for the May Day races, smiles Mary Louise, only it's not a smile at all. A dumb question like that doesn't deserve an answer. Besides, there's just me and Gretchen standing there, really, so no use wasting my breath talking to shadows. I don't think you're going to win this time, says Rosie, trying to signify with her hands on her hips all salty, completely forgetting that I have whooped her behind many times for less salt than that. I always win because I'm the best, I say straight at Gretchen, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the only one talking in this ventriloquist dummy routine. Gretchen smiles, but it's not a smile. And I'm thinking that girls never really smile at each other because they don't know how and don't want to know how. And there's probably no one to teach us how because grown-up girls don't know either. Then they all look at Raymond, who has just brought his mule team to a standstill. And they're about to see what trouble they can get into through him. What grade you in now, Raymond? You got anything to say to my brother? You say it to me, Mary Louise Williams of Raggedy Town, Baltimore. What are you, his mother? Sasses Rosie. That's right, Batso, and the next word out of anybody, and I'll be their mother too. So they just stand there, and Gretchen shifts from one leg to the other, and so do they. Then Gretchen puts her hands on her hips and is about to say something with her freckle-faced self but does it? Then she walks around me, looking me up and down, but keeps walking up Broadway, and her sidekicks follow her. So me and Raymond smile at each other, and he says, Giddy up! to his team, and I continue with my breathing exercises, strolling down Broadway toward the Iceman on 145th, with not a care in the world, because I am Miss Quicksilver herself. What other evidence did you notice in this part of the story that reveals Squeaky's perception on either Raymond or Gretchen? For instance, did you notice that when Gretchen smiles at Squeaky, Squeaky dismisses her smile as fake, not a real smile? And did you notice how Squeaky stood up for Raymond when Mary Louise and Rosie started picking on him? What does this show us about her view of Raymond? Go ahead and record additional evidence and elaboration for paragraphs 5 to 13 in your table. Here's an example of what your table will look like. Let's review what we've learned about Squeaky's views of Raymond and Gretchen in this first part of the story. Take a moment to review the evidence you found, then pause and think to reflect on this question using your evidence organizer. I wish we could share our thoughts about these questions together in person. If you have a friend or family member, I encourage you to share what you've learned so far in Raymond's Run. You might also think about and share how some of your experiences have shaped your views of other people, as Squeaky's experiences have shaped her views of Raymond and Gretchen. In part two of our lesson, we will read the rest of Raymond's run. In this part of the lesson, we will examine how Squeaky's perspective or viewpoint changes towards her brother, Raymond, and her running rival, Gretchen, as a result 
of the race. Remember when we left off reading in part one, Squeaky and Raymond run into Gretchen and her sidekicks, Rosie and Mary Louise, on a street in the Harlem neighborhood. Squeaky takes her meeting as an opportunity to remind Gretchen that she does not intend to lose the big May Day race. And complete a quick write in your journal. What do you think will happen in the race? Why? Just as we did in part one, we will read with a purpose to understand how Squeaky's views towards her brother and Gretchen change as a result of the race. Before we finish the story, let's take a moment to set up our graphic organizer. This will help us focus our attention and gather evidence. Open up a new blank spread in your journal. At the top of the right page, write Squeaky's view of Raymond after the race. Underneath, make a T-chart with two columns. Label the left column evidence. This is where you will record your actual words from the text that show Squeaky's new view of each character. Label the right column elaboration. Remember, this is where you will explain what the evidence shows about Squeaky's new view of each character. At the top of the left page, write Squeaky's view of Gretchen after the race. Underneath, make a t-chart with two columns labeled evidence and elaboration, just as you did on the first chart. Now, we will read the rest of Raymond's run. As you read or listen to me read out loud, jot down details in the evidence columns that show how Squeaky's view of Raymond and Gretchen change as a result of the race. In the elaboration column, explain what does the evidence show about Squeaky's new view of each character. Part two of Raymond's Run. I take my time getting to the park on May Day because the track meet is the last thing on the program. The biggest thing on the program is the May pole dancing, which I can do without. Thank you. Even if my mother thinks it's a shame, I don't take part and act like a girl for a change. You'd think my mother'd be grateful not to have to make me a white organdy dress with a big satin sash and buy me new white baby doll shoes that can't be taken out of the box till the big day. You'd think she'd be glad her daughter ain't out there prancing around a maypole, getting the new clothes all dirty and sweaty and trying to act like a fairy or a flower or whatever you're supposed to be when you should be trying to be yourself, whatever that is which is, as far as I'm concerned, a poor black girl who really can't afford to buy shoes and a new dress you can only wear once a lifetime because it won't fit next year. I was once a strawberry in a Hansel and Gretel pageant when I was in nursery school and didn't have no better sense than to dance on tiptoe with my arms in a circle over my head, doing umbrella steps and being a perfect fool just so my mother and father could come dressed up and clap. You think they'd know better than to encourage that kind of nonsense. I am not a strawberry. I do not dance on my toes. I run. That is what I am all about. So I always come late to the May Day program, just in time to get my number pinned on and lay in the grass till they announce the 50-yard dash. I put Raymond in the little swings, which is a tight squeeze this year and will be impossible next year. Then I look around for Mr. Pearson, who pins the numbers on. I'm really looking for Gretchen, if you want to know the truth. But she's not around. The park is jam-packed. Parents in hats and corsages and breast pocket handkerchiefs peeking up. Kids in white dresses and light blue suits. The parkies unfolding chairs and chasing the rowdy kids from Lenox as if they had no right to be there. The big guys with their caps on backwards leaning against the fence, swirling the basketballs on the tips of their fingers, waiting for all the crazy people to clear out of the park so they can play. Most of the kids in my class are carrying bass drums and glockenspiels and flutes. You'd think they'd put in a few bongos or something for real like that. Then here comes Mr. Pearson with his clipboard and his cards and pencils and whistles and safety pins and 50 million other things he's always dropping all over the place with his clumsy self. He sticks out in the crowd because he's on stilts. We used to call him Jack and the Beanstalk to get him mad, but I'm the only one that can outrun him and get away. I'm too grown for that silliness now. 
Well, Squeaky, he says, checking my name off the list and handing me number seven and two pins. And I'm thinking he's got no right to call me Squeaky if I can call him Beanstalk. Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker. I correct him and tell him to write it down on his board. Well, Hazel Elizabeth Deborah Parker, going to give someone else a break this year? I squint at him real hard to see if he is seriously thinking I should lose the race on purpose just to give someone else a break. Only six girls running this time. He continues shaking his head sadly like it's my fault all of New York didn't turn out in sneakers. That new girl should give you a run for your money. He looks around the park for Gretchen like a periscope in a submarine movie. Wouldn't it be a nice gesture if you were uh to uh I give him such a look he couldn't finish putting that idea into words. Grown ups got a lot of nerve sometimes. I pin number seven to myself and stomp away. I'm so burnt, and I go straight for the track and stretch out on the grass while the band winds up with Oh the monkey wrapped his tail around the flagpole, which my teacher calls by some other name. The man on the loudspeakers calling everyone over to the track, and I'm on my back, looking at the sky, trying to pretend I'm in the country. But I can't, because even grass in the city feels hard as sidewalk, and there's just no pretending you are anywhere but in a concrete jungle, as my grandfather says. The 20-yard dash takes all of two minutes, because most of the little kids don't know no better than to run off the track or run the wrong way or run smack into the fence and fall down and cry. One little kid, though, has got the good sense to run straight for the white ribbon up ahead so he wins. Then the second graders line up for the 30-yard dash, and I don't even bother to turn my head to watch because Rafael Perez always wins. He wins because he even begins by psyching the runners, telling them they're going to trip on their shoelaces and fall on their faces or lose their shorts or something, which he doesn't really have to do since he is very fast, almost as fast as I am. After that is the 40-yard dash, which I used to run when I was in first grade. Raymond is hollering from the swings because he knows I'm about to do my thing because the man on the loudspeaker has just announced the 50-yard dash although he might just as well be given a recipe for angel food cake because you can hardly make out what he's saying for the static. I get up and slip off my sweatpants and then I see Gretchen standing at the starting line, kicking her legs out like a pro. Then as I get into place, I see that old Raymond is on line on the other side of the fence, bending down with his fingers on the ground, just like he knew what he was doing. I was going to yell at him, but then I didn't. It burns up your energy to holler. Did you notice any evidence in this paragraph that reveals a change in Squeaky's perspective of Gretchen? One detail really stood out to me in paragraph 22. Squeaky observes Gretchen kicking her legs out like a pro. What do you think this shows about how her view of Gretchen is changing? I think this shows that she's beginning to regard and maybe even respect Gretchen as a serious runner, just like herself. Did you notice any evidence in this paragraph that shows a change in how Squeaky views Raymond? Right before the race, Squeaky sees Raymond bending down with his fingers on the ground, just like he knew what he was doing. How does Squeaky's observation reveal a change in how she views Raymond? I think it shows that Squeaky is surprised that Raymond is acting like a real runner. She has never considered Raymond as an athlete, just the brother she has to look after. Every time, just before I take off in a race, I always feel like I'm in a dream. The kind of dream you have when you're sick with fever and feel all hot and weightless. I dream I'm flying over a sandy beach in the early morning sun, kissing the leaves of the trees as I fly by. And there's always the smell of apples, just like in the country when I was little and used to think I was a choo-choo train running through the fields of corn and chugging up the hill to the orchard. And all the time I'm dreaming this, I get lighter and lighter until I'm flying over the beach again, getting blown through the sky like a feather that weighs nothing at all. But once I spread my fingers in the dirt and crouch over the get on your mark, the dream goes and I am solid again. And I'm telling myself, squeaky. You must win. You must win. You are the fastest thing in the world. You can even beat your father up 
Amsterdam if you really try. And then I feel my weight coming back just behind my knees, then down to my feet, then into the earth, and the pistol shot explodes in my blood, and I am off and weightless again, flying past the other runners, my arms pumping up and down, and the whole world is quiet except for the crunch as I zoom over the gravel in the track. I glance to my left, and there is no one. To the right, a blurred Gretchen, who's got her chin jutting out as if it would win the race all by itself. And on the other side of the fence is Raymond, with his arms down to his side and the palms tucked up behind him, running in his very own style. And it's the first time I ever saw that. And I almost stopped to watch my brother Raymond on his first run. But the white ribbon is bouncing toward me, and I tear past it. Racing into the distance till my feet, with a mind of their own, start digging up footfuls of dirt and break me short. Then all the kids standing on the side pile on me, banging on the back and slapping my head with their May Day programs, for I have won again. And everybody on 151st Street can walk tall for another year. You're watching My IPS on My Indy TV 23. A free educational service provided by Circle City Broadcasting of Indianapolis. Here's what's coming up this hour. Get more information, special announcements, and weekly program schedules online at wishtv.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook. Here's what's coming up next. Welcome back to Knowledge on the Go, Wit and Wisdom, Virtual Lessons. My name is Virginia Day, and I'm one of your teachers for this virtual learning experience. Today, we are about to begin Lesson 3 of Module 4, Courage and Crisis. In this part of the lesson, you will need shipwreck at the bottom of the world, a journal, a pen and pencil, handout 2A, 3A, and 3B. Remember, if you're using an electronic workspace, that's totally fine. And if you don't have a copy of a text, that's all right, because we do a lot of the reading together aloud. How do Shackleton and his crew respond to the hostile environment of Antarctica? While we're building our knowledge around that focusing question, we're also discovering more about Shackleton's heroic response to the environment, which brings us back to our essential question. We're building knowledge about the hostile environment of Antarctica, but also Shackleton's heroic response to that environment. Our content framing question for the lesson is this, what's happening in shipwreck at the bottom of the world? In the first part of this lesson, we will continue to notice and wonder about some of the photographs in chapters two and three. But then, in the next part of our lesson, we will move to organize and begin using a variety of strategies to ensure we have a literal understanding of what's happening in the text. That's better. One of the important pieces of this text is the photographs. Armstrong included 40 photographs to help communicate ideas of shipwreck at the bottom of the world. Not only are the photographs fascinating to look at, but the photographs and captions are integral because they include information that is not included in the regular text. Taking time to close read these photos and captions can help us enhance our understanding of the adventure that the Endurance and her crew took. So now we're going to take a look at handout 3A. It's our list of art terminology that can and should be used when discussing these photographs. Today, we are going to consider layout, mood, foreground and background of certain photographs. So the layout is how images and text are arranged on the page. The mood is the emotion or feeling that is evident in the reader or the viewer as they look at the photo. 
The foreground is the area in a painting or photograph that is closest to the viewer, while the background is the area in a painting or photograph that seems the farthest away. Here's a photograph of Ernest Shackleton. I notice that the layout has his photograph taking up the entire page. He looks very serious in the portrait, and it makes sense to me that his nickname is The Boss, as the caption tells us. I'm feeling that this photograph conveys a serious mood. And the other important thing to notice about the foreground and the background in this photo, the background is blurry, and the foreground is a close-up shot of Shackleton. He is the complete picture and nothing else. Did you notice any of those? Let's compare. So those were some notices that you may, might have come up with. What about the wonders? I had to wonder, did Armstrong include that layout because she wanted to emphasize Shackleton's importance? And the other wonder that I have is what kind of leader is Shackleton? What do you notice about the layout of the photographs on this page? Take a minute and compare this layout to the one of Shackleton's. Let me put them side by side and get out of the picture. <laughs> no pun intended. So you can do that on your own. How does this layout differ from the photograph of Shackleton? I'm sure you notice that the second layout includes four photographs that are equally sharing one page. I also notice that each photograph takes up about one quarter of the space of Shackleton's photograph. I wonder if they're important members of his crew. Now, let's do a close read of this photograph of Percy Blackborough, the stowaway, and Mrs. Chippy, the cat. Really take a few minutes to notice the details of this photo. Particularly, you can notice that the foreground and background are similar to the one of Shackleton. The background is blurry and the foreground is clear. But what do you notice about the mood? Think about that for a minute. What do you notice about the different men's expressions on these three photographs? If you were going to describe them, what adjectives might you use to describe Shackleton? Maybe he looks wise and decisive, almost like he has weighty or important matters to decide. The men's expressions in these photos. They seem thoughtful, serious, but I also feel like they seem very confident in Black Arrow. I love the mood that's portrayed in this photo. He looks young and carefree and innocent. So how do you think the mood is different in Shackleton's photo from Black Arrow's? Okay, I felt that Black Arrow's photograph seemed light and friendly, especially when contrasted to the mood from the other photos. How does the cat on Black Burrow's shoulder make him appear? I think that having Mrs. Chippy on his shoulder almost seems more playful, makes him seem like more of a kid, whereas Shackleton sits back and looks serious, like he has a lot of responsibilities and decisions to make. You guys are doing great. There's been a lot of studying of the photographs so far. Now we're going to take a look at two more in the first part of this lesson. But before I show them to you, I want to know what you notice and wonder about the foreground and background in the next two photographs. If you have a copy of the book, you can actually look on page 13 and page 16. I also want you to notice what is the effect of having certain things closer or farther away from the viewer. Ready? Do you notice in this photo? The whaling station in the foreground, right here, is small when compared to the huge cliffs that are in the background. How many of you noticed that the mountains actually take up probably about two thirds of this photograph, while the buildings just dot the foreground, almost like toy houses? The large size of the mountains is emphasized. And what do you think that portrays nature as? Yeah, I think so too. It makes nature seem powerful. What do you notice about the foreground and background of this photo? 
Did you notice that this photograph is mostly of the mountains on South Georgia Island? Worsley is standing in the bottom left foreground. And what effect do you think is achieved by placing Worsley in this frame? So we have the really big mountains over here. And then in the foreground, we have Worsley. I think that, yes, the photographer gives the viewer a sense of how big the mountains are. Worsley is tiny compared to the mountains, which again, what does that make us feel about nature? It makes us feel like it's very powerful in comparison to Worsley in this photo. You guys did a great job at reading those photographs with me. Now I want to take a minute and read pages two to four, paragraphs one to five aloud to you. If you have a copy and want to follow along, you can, but if you just want to listen, that's fine too. Ready? Burial Trans Antarctic Expedition. Ernest Henry Shackleton knew all about the weather and the Antarctic. In 1908, Shackleton had been the first explorer to come within a hundred miles of the South Pole. On his triumphal return from that journey, he was rewarded with a knighthood for his efforts. He was a world-famous celebrity, a hero to thousands who read his thrilling book on his furthest south expedition. He was determined to try again for the conquest of the South Pole, but before he could organize a new expedition, two other explorers headed for the frozen continent. In 1911, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen, Amundsen reached the Pole. Only five weeks later, Captain Robert F. Scott of England reached it, a heartbreaking second-place finish, and then died on the way back to his base. All of England mourned the death of Captain Scott. Now that the South Pole had been reached, it seemed as though the age of heroic exploration was over. And yet, was it? Antarctica had never even been sighted before the 19th century. Until then, it was a rumor an undefined, unseen question mark shrouded in fog and surrounded by ice. But it hadn't always hidden at the bottom of the world, behind a veil of frozen mist. 160 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana, which also included South America, Africa, and Australia. The Jurassic climate of Gondwana was semi-tropical, and fossils from Antarctica proved that the continent was once inhabited by giant, lightless birds, sharks, and freshwater fish, snails, beetles, reptiles, and proto-marsupials, all thriving under giant ferns and trees. The supercontinent began to break apart, however, and by 60 million years ago, Antarctica had migrated south to its present location over the Pole. In a mere 20 million years, the continent was covered with ice, and the environment had become too hostile for most living things. By modern times, only 1% of the continent was free of ice. But not only was it too cold for most life, it was also too dry, with an annual rain and snowfall of only 2 inches per year. The same as that of the Australian outback. The polar ice cap had made Antarctica a frozen desert. The cold air masses created by this ice cap clash with the warm winds from the ocean to turn up a storm belt that surrounds the continent, making the Southern Ocean the most treacherous sea anywhere. The southern latitudes from 40 degrees south latitude to the Antarctic Circle are at 67 degrees south latitude, long ago earned their nickname from the sailors who dared approach the continent. The Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and the Screaming Sixties. Countless ships have been lost in these waters. Countless sailors have lost their lives. So, now we know that there had been other explorations of Antarctica and that Shackleton had already been there once before he embarked on his journey with a crew of the Endurance. Let's think a little more about these earlier explorations so we can better understand this one. Let me read a quote to you about an expedition led <coughs> by Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen. To understand this quote, let's be sure we understand what circumnavigation means. In 1820, a Russian Navy ship 
under the command of Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, made the first circumnavigation and sighting of Antarctica. Twenty years later, James Ross began the first to bull all the way through the pack to reach land. Look at the bolded word circumnavigation. If the prefix circum means around, then circumnavigation must mean, <laughs> that's right, the act of traveling all the way around something. So that means Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen made the first circumnavigation and sighting of Antarctica traveling all the way around it. After missing the opportunity to be the first to reach Antarctica, what was Shackleton now looking to do? We know that he had the exploration bug. Read this quote with me. But Shackleton set his sights on a new goal, to be the first to cross the southern continent from one side to another. Hmm. Now would be a good time for a stop and jot. Just a reminder for those of you who are new to wit and wisdom, a stop and jot is where you stop and jot details into your journal. For this stop and jot, why do you think the cruise undertaking is called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition? Pause for a minute and stop and jot. Did you finish your stop and jot? Let me get out of the way. So why do you think the cruise undertaking is called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition? Let's think about the word trans-Antarctic. I'm going to get my drawing tool ready. So the quote says that Shackleton's goal was to cross, right here, to cross the southern continent from one side to the other. So if this is called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, trans must mean what? Yes, cross. Well done. Okay, let's check our understanding really quickly. What was Shackleton's goal for his second journey to Antarctica? Think about the quote that we just read and write that response in your journal. Hopefully you wrote down that it was to be the first to cross the southern continent from one side to the other. And why was circumnavigation not part of that goal? Think about that carefully for a second. If you remember, circumnavigation is the act of traveling around something. But we know that that is not what Shackleton was planning to do this time. He was going to travel across it. This would be a great time for you to open your journal and look at your notes of what we've learned so far. After reading or listening to chapter two, we want to know what has happened so far on the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So let's talk about it for a minute. Where was their first stop? Do you remember? Argentina. That's where they picked up their teams of dogs and a few men, including the stowaway. Next, they landed where? Yes, South Georgia Island. And they learned that the ice pack is very heavy around Antarctica. So what did they decide to do? Yeah, they delayed the expedition while waiting for warmer weather in summer to melt some of the ice pack. When they were finally able to leave South Georgia Island, they began to encounter what? Almost right away, Shackleton and his men began to encounter, yeah, large chunks of ice and icebergs. One way to organize what is happening in a chapter is to identify its section's main ideas, which are developed by key supporting details, and then combine these main ideas to write a summary. In the next few slides, I'm going to reread parts of the text to you, and we will work together to summarize chapter two. And then you will apply your awesome summarizing skills through finding supporting details for the main ideas in summarizing chapter three. Let's go. Handout 3B has already identified the main ideas for each selection of chapter two, but it's missing the key supporting details supporting them. I'm going to reread pages two to four to you while you jot down any key ideas that support the main idea that Antarctica is a compelling and unique spot on Earth. If you have a copy of the text and want to follow along, you can. But while I'm reading this, I want you to think 
about that question or about that statement. Antarctica is a compelling and unique spot on Earth. And jot down any supporting details that you hear that support that main idea. If you want to print and use handout 3B, you can, or you can copy it, it electronically or just recreate it in your journal. All of those options are fine. I also want to emphasize that a text may provide many supporting details, or it may include a few that work effectively to help develop each of its main ideas. Page two, the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition. Ernest Henry Shackleton knew all about the weather in the Antarctic. In 1908, Shackleton had been the first explorer to come within a hundred miles of the South Pole. On his triumphal return from that journey, he was rewarded with a knighthood for his efforts. He was a world-famous celebrity, a hero to thousands who read his thrilling book on his furthest South expedition. He was determined to try again for the conquest of the South Pole, but before he could organize a new expedition, two other explorers headed for the frozen continent. In 1911, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen reached the pole. Only five weeks later, Captain Robert F. Scott of England reached it, a heartbreaking second place finish, and then died on his way back to base. All of England mourned the death of Captain Scott. Now that the South Pole had been reached, it seemed as though the age of heroic exploration was over, and yet, was it? Antarctica had never even been sighted before the 19th century. Until then, it was a rumor, an undefined, unseen question mark shrouded in fog and surrounded by ice. But it hadn't always hidden at the bottom of the world behind a veil of frozen mist. 160 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana, which also included South America, Africa, and Australia. The Jurassic climate of the Gondwana was semi-tropical, and fossils from Antarctica prove that the continent was once inhabited by giant flightless birds, sharks, and other freshwater fish, snails, beetles, reptiles, and proto-marsupials, all thriving under giant ferns and trees. The supercontinent began to break apart, however, and by 60 million years ago, Antarctica had migrated south to its present location over the pole. In a mere 20 million years, the continent was covered with ice and the environment had become too hostile for most living things. By modern times, only 1% of the continent was free of ice. But not only was it too cold for most life, it was also too dry, with an annual rain and snowfall of only 2 inches per year, the same as that of the Australian outback. The polar ice cap had made Antarctica a frozen desert. The cold air masses created by this ice cap clash with warm winds from the ocean to turn up a storm belt that surrounds the continent, making the Southern Ocean the most treacherous sea anywhere. The southern latitudes from 40 degrees south latitude to the Antarctic Circle at 67 degrees south latitude long ago earned their nicknames from the sailors who dared approach the continent. The roaring 40s, the furious 50s, and the screaming 60s. Countless ships have been lost in these waters. Countless sailors have lost their lives. Did you have a chance to write down some really great supporting details for Antarctica is a compelling and unique spot on Earth? I'm sure that you did. Let me get out of the way and we can see if any of our examples are alike. Many explorers from around the world have been inspired to explore this unknown continent. It definitely shows us that Antarctica is compelling and compels a lot of explorers to head there. The storm belt around the continent creates the most treacherous sea on Earth. Well, that definitely makes it unique. Antarctica is also a desert. It is very dry and only receives two inches of rain a year. Again, that really supports the fact that it's a unique spot on Earth. Handout 3B also has some other main ideas throughout Chapter 2 that it wants you to find supporting details for. One of them is many men from around the world would have been inspired by Antarctica to undertake expeditions there. 
Another one is that Shackleton was always pulled toward adventure, but exploration of Antarctica became his true calling. And that Shackleton did an excellent job financing and preparing for his expedition to cross Antarctica. I'm going to go to each main idea one at a time, and I'm going to reread sections of chapter two. And while I'm doing that, I want you to have your journal ready, or you can actually have your handout be with you or your electronic working space. And I want you to listen and find the best supporting details for each main idea. We're going to start with this one. Many men from around the world would have been inspired by Antarctica to undertake expeditions there. These perilous seas kept the continent locked away until 1774, when Captain James Cook reached the farthest south latitude yet attained. He wormed his ship through the ice pack to reach 71 degrees south latitude, and then turned north again without ever seeing the land. In 1820, a Russian navy ship, under the command of Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen, made the first circumnavigation and sighting of the continent. Twenty years later, James Ross began the first to bowl all the way through the path to reach land. As the 19th century ran out, more and more of the continent was mapped and described by navigators from around the world, although Antarctica claimed many ships as payment. By the turn of the century, the fringes of the continent were fairly well defined on the charts, but the interior was still an unknown wasteland of ice. Then came the race to the South Pole. Shackleton's attempt in 1908 ended when he was thrown back by terrible weather conditions, only 97 miles from his goal. The prize ultimately went to Amundsen on December 14, 1911, and Scott stumbled to the pole just over that a month later on January 17, 1912, and there were still 5.5 million square miles untouched by man an area 25% larger than the continent of Europe. All of late England, including Shackleton, regretted losing the honor of being the first at the pole, but Shackleton set his sights on a new goal, to be the first to cross the southern continent from one side to the other. There was indeed much more exploring to be done. Did any of you share this detail? that many ships and their sailors have lost their lives south of the Antarctic Circle? That definitely talks about the undertaking of expeditions there. There were a lot of details that you could have used that support the fact that men are inspired to undertake expeditions to Antarctica. Did anybody write down how Shackleton was actually beat at the South Pole by two other explorers? Or maybe... You said that by the end of the 1800s, the perimeter of Antarctica had been well described by many explorers. Any of those would work. Now let's take a look at the third main idea of Chapter 2. Shackleton was always pulled toward adventure, but exploration of Antarctica became his true calling. Once again, get your journals ready or your handout. I'm going to reread part of the text for you, and I want you to listen to the best supporting key details that help support this main idea. On December 29, 1913, the London Times trumpeted, We are able to announce today, with a satisfaction which shall be universally shared, that Sir Ernest Shackleton will lead a new expedition to the South Pole next year. Lord Curzon, President of the Royal Geographical Society, summed up the feelings of most of Shackleton's fans, quote, that it is a task worthy to be undertaken by an Englishman is to me quite clear, and that of living Englishmen you are the best fitted by training, experience, and prestige to carry it out successfully, none will be found to deny. Even without such support, however, Shackleton had to go on, had to go to Antarctica again, because the continent pulled him like a magnet. I am just good as an explorer and nothing else, he wrote to his wife Emily. He had been bitten hard by the exploring bug. An Irishman by birth, the 40-year-old Shackleton was a showman with a hunger for polar glory. As a child, he had been something of a loner, reading adventure stories during his school days and dreaming of fame and fortune. 
At 16, he joined the Merchant Marine, and his first voyage took him around Cape Horn in the winter. It was his first experience of the Southern Ocean. By 1900, at age 26, he had risen in the ranks of the merchant service, carrying mail and cargo around the British Empire. But he worried that his routine voyages might, in fact, be a dead end. Citing his years of experience at sea, he presented himself at the offices of the National Antarctic Expedition in London. In 1901, as a junior officer aboard the Discovery, captained by Robert F. Scott, he headed for Antarctica for the first time. There was no going back for Shackleton. He had found his true calling. After Discovery came his furthest south expedition in 1908. We're going to talk about a few of the responses that you might have written down. Did any of you say that Shackleton went to Antarctica for the first time in 1901? Or maybe you guys said that he attempted to reach the South Pole in 1908. There was a really good quote in there that Shackleton wrote to his wife. And he said, quote, I am just good as an explorer and nothing else, end quote. Antarctica was his true calling. Maybe you talked about how he'd been bitten by the bug of exploration. All of those are really good examples. If you didn't have time to get them down, make sure you take the time to write them down now. Or if you only had a couple details and wanted another, you can actually take time now to add another detail. This is My IPS on My Indie TV 23. Here's what's coming up next. Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Miss Carlton and today we are going to be working in the seventh grade reading packet. Okay, so please open up the seventh grade reading packet that looks like this. We are on page 15. We are working on lesson eight, part three. Okay, I am going to read to you the text. While I'm reading, please go ahead and follow along on your own paper. In an uncontrollable fury, Glue Scrap screamed at the Wasis that he alone was the mightiest warrior. This time, the Wasis did respond. It opened its throat and let out a terrible, heartbroken wail. Glooscap covered his ears, but the creature's howls split his skull. He asked it to stop crying, but it would not. He danced a funny dance, sang a song, and made a face. But it wasn't until Glooscap held the Wasis that the creature was finally appeased. Subdued, the baby cooed goo at his father, for son and father they were. And forever after, when a baby coos goo goo at his father, the Wasis remembers his victory over Glooscap. All right, so underneath here, this question is asking us about summary. So this is a continuation of what we have been working on, okay, talking about what makes a good summary. And as a recap, a good summary is objective, so that means it includes no opinions, it includes information about characters, and the setting if the setting is relevant to the plot. And it includes two to three main plot points. So you're going to tell me two to three of the main things that happened in the story. So we need to make a list of important events that happened in our story. So one of the most important things that happened in this story is the Wasis crying loudly. The reason that this is important is because it sets us up for the rest of the story. So I would make a note somewhere on your paper. Another important plot event in this passage is that Glooscap holds Wasis to calm him down. The reason this is important is because this is the resolution to the story. Okay. 
So for our important events, we have written, Wasis is crying loudly, and Glooscap holds Wasis to calm him down. Now, based on this list here, I would like you to independently take a moment to answer this question. Which of the following choices is the best summary of the story ending? Okay, so we are summarizing this passage that we have just read. I encourage you to use our list of important plot points from this passage. Just take a moment and circle the answer that you think is correct. All right, very nice. So if you circled B, go ahead and give yourself a big pat on the back. The reason that it is B is because it includes both of our plot points and no opinions. So B is the correct answer. Now I'd like you to answer the question at the bottom of the page on your own. This is a show your thinking question that reads, explain why one other answer choice is not a good summary. So we've said that B is the best answer, but choose one of the other answer choices and explain why it's incorrect. Okay, you've done a wonderful job today. Great work, everybody. This is My IPS on My Indie TV 23. Here's what's coming up next. Good morning, everybody. I'm Miss Carlton, and today we are working on seventh grade reading. So please go ahead and open up your seventh grade reading packets. It should look just like this on the front cover. We are on page 16. We are doing lesson 16, working with analogies this morning. So please go ahead and get to the correct page if you are not there already. Now at the top, there is a short introduction. I hope you've already looked at it, but I'm gonna explain it to you just a little bit before we start our guided practice today. So analogies are just the types of relationships between words. So an analogy explains the relationship between words in a pair and between two pairs of words. So for example, this reads all together, near is to distant as hidden is to exposed. Okay, so you'll notice that although I said is to and as out loud, that's not actually written up here in our analogy. In its place are colons. So a singular colon stands for the phrase is to, and this double colon in the middle stands for the word as. So near is to distant, as hidden is to exposed. Okay, something else that I'd like you to notice is that the words are broken down into two pairs. So pair one is near and distant, and pair two is hidden and exposed. So an analogy is exploring the relationship between the words within the pair and between the two pairs. So let's start breaking this down. Near and distant, okay, so near versus far, those mean the opposite thing. That is called an antonym. So near and distant are antonyms. Let's look at hidden and exposed, okay? Something hidden versus something exposed to the world, those are also antonyms, correct? So we have two words that are antonyms. So what this is saying is that near is to distant. Near is an antonym of distant. In the same way, hidden is also an antonym of exposed. So this is what we would call an antonym type of analogy. Okay? There are several different types of analogies that I would like to show you. Okay? This is also on your paper, so please feel free to follow along on your paper. There's a synonym type of analogy, and this means that all of the words mean the same thing. An example of that would be friendly is to nice as rapid is to fast. Right? Friendly and nice mean the same thing, and rapid and fast also mean the same thing. Now, an antonym analogy, that's the one we just did, right? So near is to distant as hidden is to exposed, okay? Near and distant are opposites, and so are hidden and exposed. The next type of analogy is called the cause and effect analogy. Here's an example. Fire is to scorch as drought is to wither, right? Fire 
causes something to be scorched. In the same way, drought or lack of rain causes plants to wither and become dry. So the cause is followed by the effect in both cases. Part versus whole is our next type of analogy. Foot is to leg as leaf is to branch. So a foot is a smaller part of the body that is attached to the leg. In the same way, the leaf is a smaller part of the plant that is attached to the branch. Next up, we have item and category type of analogy. Horse is to animal as car is to vehicle, right? So the horse is an animal, and in the same way, a car is a vehicle. Finally, we have the tool and user type of analogy. Camera is to photographer as stove is to chef, right? The camera is a tool that a photographer would use. In the same way, a stove is a tool that a chef would use, okay? So hopefully you've been able to understand the different types of analogies, their names, and you've seen some examples. Now we're gonna look at the bottom of the page that's labeled guided practice. And we have four practice problems that we are going to work through together. So what we need to do on this line is we need to finish the analogy. You'll notice at the bottom of your paper, underneath each analogy, we actually have three choices. They're in bold, okay? So from the three choices, we need to pick which one makes the most sense to put on the line. Then, on your next line, we need to write what type of analogy it is. So, the first one reads, cent is to dollar as inch is to something. Okay, so the cent is actually part of a dollar, right? If you break a dollar down into smaller parts, you will end up with cents. In the same way, the inch is the, a smaller part of something, right? So is it a smaller part of a foot, a meter, or a worm? Hopefully, you said foot. Okay, so this would read, cent is to dollar as inch is to foot. Now, when we're talking about breaking down something whole into its parts, that type of analogy is the part and whole analogy. So you would simply write, part and whole on your second line. Now, the next one, saw is to carpenter as telescope is to blank. Okay, so our three choices are constellation, lens, or astronomer. So we first need to look at the relationship between saw and carpenter. The saw is a tool that the carpenter uses, correct? So the telescope is a tool that who uses? Based on our choices, that would be the astronomer. So on your line, you will write the word astronomer. Now, when we're talking about the tool that a certain profession uses, let's come back to our list. That would be the tool and user type of analogy. So on the line, you will just write tool and user. Okay, you're doing great. Two more to go. Number three, tragedy is to sorrow as triumph is to blank. So let's look at our options. Victory, hero, or pride. All right, so tragedy and sorrow, that means the same thing. That's, in both cases, that's referring to an instance of great sadness. So triumph is referring to a time when you're winning, right? When you have overcome something. So we need to find a word that is a synonym for triumph. From those choices, that would be victory. So on the line, you would simply write victory. Now, if we have a bunch of words that mean the same thing, what type of analogy would that be? Hopefully you said synonym analogy, and if you did, give yourself a big thumbs up. On the line, we're just going to write synonym. Okay, one last one. Eagle is to bird as shark is to what? Okay, so the relationship between eagle and bird, the eagle is a bird, correct? So the shark is what? 
Our options are tuna, ocean, or fish. So the shark isn't tuna and it isn't the ocean, meaning that shark must be fish. So if we're looking at an animal and the category that it falls into, what type of analogy would that be? If you said item in category, you are doing a great job. Go ahead and write that on the line. Okay, next up, you are going to be looking at page 17. Page 17 has five analogy questions, and you're going to do that on your own. But if you are confused, reach out to your language arts teacher. Best of luck. This is My IPS on My Indie TV 23. Here's what's coming up next. everybody, my name is Ms. Carlton and today we are working on our 7th grade reading packet. Looks like this, so if you're not with this packet, please go ahead and open up your 7th grade reading packet. We are on page 18 and we are working on lesson 8, part 4. So this is what your page should look like. If you're not already there, please take a moment to open up your 7th grade reading packet to page 18. Now, on page 18, there is a story called Beowulf and Grendel. I'm going to be reading that story to you. While I'm reading, please follow along yourself in your packets. Beowulf and Grendel by Javier Moreno. Long, long ago, there lived a great king named Hrothgar, who benevolently ruled over Denmark and its people. Every night, the king hosted great feasts in here at Hall, and joined in the merriment as songs were sung and stories were told. Outside, lurking in the gloom, was a hideous monster named Grendel, who hated the merry sounds that came from the hall. The sounds of song and laughter tortured him. Finally, late one night when the unsuspecting guest lay sleeping, Grendel entered the hall and killed 30 of Hrothgar's men. For the 12 long years that followed, no songs or laughter came from here at Hall. Even the bravest and strongest of Hrothgar's soldiers were powerless against the wrath of Grendel. Finally, a hero appeared, Beowulf, who looked like a boy to Hrothgar's warriors. They gasped as he stood before the king of the Danes and declared, I will kill this monster. I will leave behind my sword and I shall destroy him with my bare hands. The brave words of the youthful Beowulf filled King Hrothgar with hope. That night there was feasting and merriment in here at Hall once more. When darkness fell over the land and each man went to take his rest, Beowulf alone stayed watchful and vigilant, waiting for the battle he knew was sure to transpire. At last, Grendel entered Herod Hall. Just as the monster was about to seize Beowulf, the youth caught Grendel by the arm, and man and monster wrestled until daylight. The battle was fierce and wild, but Beowulf emerged the victor. Fatally wounded, he reached the lake where he made his home. There he plunged into the water and quickly sank, never again to terrorize the Danes. All right, please make sure you keep this passage handy. Just set that next to you and we are going to keep going on to page 19, okay? But we do need the text, so keep that out. Now, on page 19, we are going to continue to answer questions about how to write a good summary. So, to recap, a good summary is objective. It does not include opinion. A good summary includes information about characters and about setting if the setting is relevant to the passage. A good summary includes two to three main plot points, so main events that happen in the story. Now based on this list, let's go ahead and try to answer number one together. So the way that I like to do this is by using process of elimination, okay? Reading each of our possible answers and going through and eliminating things that would not be good fits for a quality summary. 
So question number one reads, which of the following statements would you most likely include in a summary of Beowulf and Grendel? A. Harret Hall was once King Rothgar's favorite place. Now, yes or no, would you include that in a quality summary? If you said no, you would be correct. Hopefully, your reasoning for that is because this is never directly stated. This is mostly something that we can infer from the text, and that would be a good inference, but that's not something that's very important. So I would say no, because it is never stated in the text, and it is unimportant. B, Grendel preferred to live in dark, gloomy places. Is this a sentence that you would include in a quality summary? If you said no, you're correct. Okay, and the reason for that is largely the same as A. While this would be a great inference that you could make from the text, this is not something that's necessarily a major plot point of the story. So we would not include this because it's unimportant, right? Grendel is an important character, but that fact about him is not really going to make the cut as one of the most important facts from the story. C. Rothgar shows great weakness compared to the courageous Beowulf. Now, would you include this in a summary of Beowulf and Grendel? Hopefully you said no, but I think that this one is going to trip some people up, so let's talk about it. While you might be inclined to agree with this sentence, this is an opinion, right? Opinion words are great, weakness, and courageous. You're giving me your opinion that Rothgar is weak and Beowulf is courageous. So we can't include that because it is not objective. Remember that a summary has to be objective and not include your opinion. Finally, D, Beowulf promises King Rothgar that he will kill Grendel. Would you include this in a summary of Beowulf and Grendel? Hopefully you said yes, and not just because it's the last answer. The reason that we would include this is because this is a major plot moment, right? If Beowulf never promises King Rothgar that he will kill Grendel, then Grendel never gets killed. The story never has a major plot point, right? So this is very important because it's one of our two to three main plot points. So using this same method, please go ahead and answer number two on your own. Number two reads, which is the best summary of the last paragraph in the story? Now you'll do just the same thought process that I just modeled for you, However, this time, you're only looking at paragraph five, the final paragraph in the story. So please take a moment and go ahead and work on that independently. So finally, we are going to finish with number three on page 19. Number three reads, write a summary of the story Beowulf and Grendel in your own words. Be sure to be objective and include at least three details about main characters, setting, and important events. So, while I'm not going to write this for you, I will help you brainstorm so that you can write this independently after you're done watching. So, I have three columns here, characters, setting, and events. We need to come up with some objective facts from the text about characters, setting, and events in the story Beowulf and Grendel. So let's start with characters. Who are our two main characters? Hopefully you said Beowulf and Grendel. That is the title. So we have Beowulf Okay, Beowulf is a young warrior, so we can make a note. We have Grendel who is, of course, the what? Hopefully you said monster, or even better, antagonist. Okay, so we can make a note. 
And our final most important character would be Hrothgar, the king. Okay, so now we have all of our characters mentioned. If I were you, I would make some sort of effort to include all of these characters in your summary. Let's move on to setting. Okay, so what country do they live in? Please have a look back at the story. It is in paragraph one. We are looking for what country this story takes place in. Hopefully you said Denmark, and if you did, you would be correct. You could also make note of where specifically in Denmark this story takes place, and that would be Parrot Hall. Okay. So now if I were you, I would mention the setting somehow in your summary. Finally, we need to list two to three main events of the story. So let's go in order. What is the first main event that sets the scene for the rest of the story? Take a moment and go ahead and look back in your text. Hopefully, you said that the first important thing that happens is that Grendelwolf attacks the hall and kills the men. I would agree. The reason that this is so important is because if Grendel never attacks Herod Hall, Beowulf has no reason to have this mighty battle with him that we see in the climax of the story. So let's think about the next main event. Grendel has attacked the hall, and for 12 years, the men have been afraid and have been hiding from Grendel. So the next main event that happens is that Beowulf announces that he is going to come and defeat Grendel. Why is that important? Because if Beowulf never makes this proclamation, the story can't move forward, right? If Beowulf never comes to Herod Hall and makes this announcement, this is just a depressing story about a bunch of guys who are scared of a monster. I would not read that. So, main event number two is that Beowulf announces his intentions. So now we have two major plot points. So after Beowulf announces that he will fight Grendel, what do you think logically might be your next main event of the story? If you said Beowulf's fight with Grendel, you would be correct and a logical thinker. So our third main event is the Beowulf versus Grendel fight. And of course, Beowulf comes out on top. So now that you have this list, these are all the components that you should be including in your objective summary. Remember, that summary should be objective and include no opinion. It should include information about characters and setting. And it should include two to three main plot points. So now independently, you are going to use this information to answer question number three, you are going to write a summary of Beowulf and Grendel on your own. However, if you get stuck, please reach out to your English teacher because they'd be more than happy to help. Best of luck. I think I need to call in sick. Why, what's wrong? My throat is sore, I'm dizzy, runny nose. It sounds like nasal pharyngitis. More than a dozen surprisingly specialized education models to choose from. Explore them all online. Yeah, that's IPS. You've been watching My IPS on My Indie TV 23, a free educational service provided by Circle City Broadcasting of Indianapolis. My IPS airs weekday mornings from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. For more information, 
special announcements, and the weekly program schedule, go to wishtv.com. You can also follow us on Facebook.